Welcome to the Utah Football Fans Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and share. And as always, go Utes. Let's do it. Welcome to the Utah Football Fans Podcast. My name is Bryn, here with James. It is spring football. Spring football is here. We've taken a little bit of the off season, but it's April. It's alive. Everything's happening. We're so excited to be here. Please make sure you are subscribed and you're liking and following the channel. And a huge thank you to our sponsor, Thomas Orthodontics. Please look him up at thomasortho.com. I'm rushing through all of this because we are so excited today. We want to get to our special guest. This has been like a dream of ours for, we've talked about this for a while, James. I probably since we started the podcast that we wanted to have this man on, the one and only legend in Pac-12 broadcasting. I think I can say that. Yogi Roth. (laughs) Yay! Welcome, Yogi. (laughs) I'll play that for my boys, for our kids. That's really, they listen to that one every once in a while. Thank you for having me. A uh, huge fan of what you guys do. And I think I'd speak for all analysts. Like when we get ready for games, we we lean into people like you guys who are you know, boots on the ground all the time. So thank you for what you're doing and fired up to come on today. And, and can't wait to get to Salt Lake City. It's been over a year since I've been there. Yeah. So we've been talking about that. So Yogi is actually coming and calling our spring game, which is this Saturday in Rice Eccles. We're, we were just talking about the weather. I think you're going to have sunny and awesome weather, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, well, just to start, I, w- I was kind of looking at your bio, and you have a very extensive background. I think that maybe a lot of people don't even realize. So could you just give us a brief overview of your background, your experience, and what's led you to where you are today? Sure. Yeah. Um, happy to do that briefly for sure. Uh, to me, everything in my life goes to the same funnel, which is to seek and uncover the humanity in sports all over the world. And in the fall, it's college football season. And that's, of course, led over to the spring. Uh, and every decision I've ever made has really gone through that lens of can I see, can I cover, can I teach, can I celebrate? And it's all founded in football. You know, I played everything growing up. I got lucky and, and walked on and got a scholarly at Pitt. I was kind of the very slow version of Britton Covey when I was there and then got out West and started coaching, coached at SC. And I fell in love with the Pacific 10 conference at the time. And then when the Pac-12 network started, I was working at Fox calling games for them. I said, God, let me get in on the ground floor someplace. Keep me on the West coast, call these games, be around these teams. Uh, and I, and I got lucky and got in day one. I was one of the first employees there at the Pac-12 when it became the 12 and one of the first employees, at the Pac-12 network, and have been really happy to do a little bit of everything from calling games and features and you know, writing books and doing documentaries and all the things that really revolve around the sport that I love. And I think, honestly, uh, if I had to net out what do I love the most, I, I love Saturdays. And if you looked at my call sheets, like they're behind me, where at the bottom of it, they all say, celebrate the game and coach the viewer. And I hope that every Utah fan who watched any of our broadcasts over the years with Ted Robinson and myself and our crew, they would say, yeah, that crew celebrated the game of football and they coached me up a little bit. And it felt like I was kicking it with these two guys and, and their crew throughout the game. And uh, I hope we've done that. I'm proud of that. And, and that's what led me to here, to come on back in a, in a unique uh, circumstance to call the Utah spring game on the Pac-12 network when they're going to the Big 12. So okay. leaning in all of it. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, hey, we're, we're, we're thankful that you would join us. Um, we have been trying to do this for a while. I think I've DM'd Yogi like, 75 times and finally we made it happen so i we appreciate it we really do so a lot of things we want to get to obviously expansion nil you know utah's changing conferences as as you mentioned but i I think i want to start really with utah football specifically right i'm I'm just kind of curious what what comes to your mind when you think utah football right when you're going to call a utah football game what's kind of your go-to what's your thought process on that Years ago, I was uh, an executive producer on a doc series called The Drive. And mm. you guys may remember as we followed this team all season long. And in the first meeting, you, know, you do a lot of pre production interviews. And I could still see Coach Whittingham at his desk in his office saying the following, which is, quote, 
around here, you're either in or you're in the way. And, and I love that quote. I really do. I think this generation, especially with all the things that you referenced, we may talk about on this conversation, uh, they need that. They, they, they yearn for that. They seek that, that type of structure. Uh, every interview I've listened to or read among the newcomers this spring have said uh, a, a version of, I become them, they don't become me, right? Another one of the quotes that Kyle, so, so that's where I go. I go to like a really healthy, united, tough out. Uh, in short, I call Utah a biker gang. They can roll <laughs> into your community, they can do whatever they want, they peace out however they like, and they usually leave with a victory. And you're gonna, you're, you're gonna be left a little bloodied and bruised. Uh, but they're going to do it with a smile on their face. They're going to shake you in the hand. They're going to they're gonna do it, you know, the quote unquote, the right way. Uh, and I've always felt that. You know, I got exposed to Utah football in a very uh, disappointing way. When I was at Pitt, I was a sideline reporter when Alex Smith played the Panthers in the Fiesta Bowl. It's my first year ever broadcasting. I know what I was doing. I, I went to practice. You'll love this story. And, you know, I'm a coach at heart and I'm taking all these notes of practice and all of a sudden, some guy comes over to me and says, can I have your notes? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm 22. And they give him to Coach Meyer. And I look at, I'm watching him. And he recruited me in high school. So he wouldn't remember me, but I remember him at Notre Dame. And he's going through the notes. And I go, can I have him back? And they said, no. And I was like, what the? <laughs> what? So I was like already salty. And then you guys put it all over my team like a couple <laughs> days later. Uh, but no, I, I've, I've fallen in love with the university and Mark Harlan and so many people uh, over the past, you know, I was calling Utah games back with Jordan Wynn at Fox. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of been around this team 17 years now. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I know what I'm going to get. It's kind of like mm -hmm. comfort food. Like, you know what you're going to get when Utah comes up in that email. They're like, you're calling one of their games. I'm like, okay, <laughs> physical, tough, take some shots. Won't be afraid to take risks. Going to be calculated at the end of the ball game. Yeah. A lot of NFL talent. Somebody coming off the edge is going to make life really challenging. Like, there's some just guarantees that I think go along with Kyle Whittingham. Yeah. And that's so funny that you call him a biker gang. I mean, have you seen Coach Whittingham's <laughs> motorcycle? Like, oh, yeah. How, oh, yeah. That he rides in on that on that bike and rides it to and from practice. Um, I mean, speaking of Coach Witt, obviously we are massive Coach Whittingham fans. He's always in the conversation as far as national coaches, best coaches in the country. ESPN just ranked him, I think, as third best. I'm wondering on a list, if you had to rank coaches in the country, where would you rank Coach Witt? Mm. He'd be in the top five for sure. Who, who was, it was Kalen was two. Who was one on that list? Kirby. Yeah, Kirby Smart. Yeah, I mean, it's all relative. I mean, it's all about like probably who went, like you could talk about development, you could talk about winning, you could be recruiting. Like I, I think that, uh, I think there's a lot, there's many more talented coaches in the country that are given credit for being talented. I believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent my career interviewing coaches. Uh, my favorite thing to ask coaches is about their coaching philosophy. Like, if you ever pull up any interview with me and a head coach, probably in there, especially when I first get to know them. And I think that all situations are not equitable. I felt this about Utah for a long time. They were playing nine conference games. Georgia and Alabama never played in the regular season in the last decade other than 2020. They'll play this year, which is great. Great for the game, great for the sport. But Utah didn't get to not play SC. Right, look at their schedule last year. Like they didn't get to pass on UW or Oregon. Like, so I, I think it's it's relative in that regard. Uh, I feel the same way with assistants. I think there's a lot of talented assistants that should get head jobs and don't. Mm -hmm. you know, I always go back to a story on a guy named Doug Nussmeyer, who was a coach in the NFL, longtime NFL coach. He was uh, the OC at UW, and then he left to be the OC at Alabama. And when Chris Peterson was offered the job to be the head coach at Washington, if he turned it down, they were going to hire Doug. Well. Doug didn't get the job. Chris gets it. And from that point on, Doug goes from Bama to Michigan to Florida and then goes to the NFL. He only got smarter, but because it wasn't like the perfect timing, he hasn't be become a head coach at a blue blood power five program. So I, I really believe that there's a ton of talent out there. I understand why those rankings happen. It's, it's fun. Uh, who doesn't like to trump it when their guy gets, you know, a top yeah. three, three nod. Um, but all of them. I mean, Kalen has his own story. I've gotten to know him extremely well. Kyle and his journey, uh, Kirby and his journey at his alma mater. Like there's, I mean, there's a lot, there's many more talented coaches than get credit for being talented. And the criticism 
it's warranted because they're making so much money, but it's often not that accurate or it doesn't have all the context that every coach is dealing with in real time. I'm curious to see what your thought is on, we're pretty insulated, right? I mean, we're, we're all from Utah. We're huge Utah fans, went to the school, that sort of thing. So, so we have a pretty high perception of, of Utah. And I think that people from the PAC 12 have really grown to understand Utah, but I'm curious as you're talking to people nationally, what, what's their opinion of Utah? Like when Utah football comes up, is it their top 20 program or, Oh, that's kind of a cute story. Like what does the national perception look like? Yeah, it's a it's a really fun question, James. Like the national the national perspective of people who get paid to talk about college football for a living is dramatic, resounding respect for what goes on within the walls of Utah. And they know that they could throw down physically with any big time program around the country. I felt this for years that if the Pac twelve is gonna send a team to play LSU, to play Alabama, to play you name it, play Ohio State. Utah, Oregon, pending the year, were the two teams I was going to send. Obviously, Washington would have been that this year. But Utah was always in that conversation because you knew they could handle it in the trenches. They always were there. I think what the lazy fan, and I have no problem calling out lazy regional-based fans, is that they still don't think of Utah in the same conversation as Ohio State, Michigan, even though they beat Michigan, or, or yeah, Alabama, even though they beat Alabama. Like, I still don't think that they're in that mm -hmm. conversation and I think that's okay but that we have to put context around that conversation is rooted in a hundred plus years of history that I think right. is just what college football is and I believe this about Utah like a lot of coaches feel about their program the minute you get there and see it you're like whoa because it feels like any of those other big time places it's got what five or six radio stations every day talking about Utah football 365. I feel like I, I go on them all season long. I'm like, you have another one? There's another one? There's another one? I mean, that, that's just what Utah is. It's a beautiful yeah. city that doesn't have an NFL team. Utah is that. They have every resource imaginable. Uh, and I love that the playoff is expanded because truly I believe that the, the ridiculousness, which was four teams in the CFP with five power five leagues, probably you could argue positively impacted Utah because they came from – a lesser uh, conference coming mm -hmm. into the power five. So that obviously helped them, but also impacted them negatively. Like you look at the year they lose to Oregon in the title game and they're walking into the playoff. I mean, you can go down the years and they're a playoff caliber team. I mean, that year they were I think, the best defense statistically in college football until like you know, since 1984 heading into that game. And Justin Herbert runs his own read and, you know, it's a route. So I, I just bring think, it up. Thanks, thanks for yeah. that up. <laughs> yeah. I, I think this era is going to be great for them. Like I think they walk into the Big Twelve and they become the bully in that league. Mm -hmm. uh, they're an anomaly in that league in terms of their style of play. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy. It's hard for anybody going defeated. Uh, but I don't think this program should be slowing down. And I think hopefully with the expansion of people being invited to the party at the end of the season, Utah will they'll have every opportunity to punch that every year as a Big Twelve representative. Yeah, so I mean, speaking Big 12, <laughs> this is going to be a whole new experience for us. You know, Utah, we're no stranger to change. I mean, joining the Pac-12, that was a whole new experience for us. And now Big 12. Tell Utah fans what we should expect joining the Big 12. And you kind of touched on this, but how is Utah's style going to fit in, in with those other teams? It's a great question. Um, I... I'm a believer now that in college football, while conferences do exist, and I'm a big fan of conference. I've worked for a conference for 20 years. Um, I think they're important to have, they provide a structure, but I think when we look at the, the new, the, the newness in some of these leagues, big 10, big 12, ACC, like none of these teams that go in there are ever going to feel initially, or even for like 30 years, like a big 12, big 10 ACC school. Right, I think of the Big 12, I think of Nebraska still. They grew up mm -hmm. on that. They haven't been yeah. in the Big 12 in over a decade. Right? Then I think of Texas and Oklahoma. We're no longer in the Big 12. Huh. So I, I just say that. And that's not even a shot. That's just what I think is reality from a marketing standpoint now. So I think for Utah, in terms of like fitting into the, anything, you know, regardless of what league they went into, I would argue all your only job is to treat yourselves almost like a professional franchise and throw down on the Utah brand even harder. Mm -hmm. I'd say that for the Big Ten, and, I, and I'm probably going to be calling a bunch of Big Ten games. Like I, I love, I love that league and what it stands for, um, 
but we we'd be kidding ourselves if we think any of the teams going to the Big Ten are going to overtake the brand equity of Michigan, Ohio State, Iowa, Penn State, Michigan State. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be cool. It's going to be fun. Uh, I'm leaning totally into it. But I think what do they need to bring? They need to bring in like Utah. Yeah. Like Utah football, biker gang football. They need to bring in their style of play, which they will. They're not going to change for everybody. Right? They're not going to care in that regard. But I do think it's it's easy to, I think, say, they need to be an air raid team or it's going to be this explosive wide open offense. And, and there is part of that. And we're two years removed from the most explosive offense in Utah history yeah. with a healthy cam rising. So I, I think that uh, it's like the West coast. It's always like, oh, all they do is throw it all over the yard. And you're like, well, have you watched UCLA and Oregon and Utah? And like some of these teams over the past years, it's not how they've done it. You know, you can go to the Pac-12 title game and you'd have ran the ball pretty well with Dylan mm-hmm. Johnson. So I, I yeah. think that sometimes those narratives can be labeled. Same thing in the Big Ten. It's three yards in a cloud of dust when it's three inches of snow, you know. But like fundamentally, you watch Ohio State play. It's, yeah. an intri- it's an incredible offense. Like you watch what Michigan did. I mean, it was so dynamic and complimentary. So be them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change a thing because um, I don't think you're going to see better skill. I don't think you're going to see freakish fronts like you're going to see talented teams that have nfl players just like they have in the last 12 years or 13 years in the pac yeah again thanks for bringing up ohio state's offense um a <laughs> little sore on that one still um but yeah no it was um, impressive though huh cj just oh, oh it, my was God. Amazing. I was there. Yeah. it was incredible i yeah. i have said this on this podcast seeing cj stroud in person was just unbelievable and same you know we've seen caleb williams twice and it's just different right? Like you're just kind of watching it and you're going, that guy, he's just, he's just different. And yeah, Stroud putting up, I think it was 940 yards or something like that against us. I don't know what it was, but um, I still could have won, still could have won. So um, close. <laughs> I'm curious as college football is changing, right? Like the last, I don't know, three years, so many things have changed. I, I'd love to get your perspective and your take specifically right now on NIL, right? Like What's your opinion on NIL? Has it bettered the game? Has it worsened it? I, I, I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on that. Sure. I think uh, it's easy to say that it's torn the game apart. And I will not say that because uh, I think that is a, an ill-informed opinion. I think there's parts of it, again, unintended consequences of everything. I right? like for sure, like give your kid a phone and he's probably going to stumble into something he can't, you don't want him stumbling into. Like there's going to be things uh, of course, that has happened. We'd be, um, you know, our head would be in the ground if, if, if we thought that was the case. But there's been so many times where, let's just start in the beginning, players could fund their parents' living arrangements. I mean, I still think about when I was in college and my teammates were sending their $950 scholarship check home to pay for rent. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. there's there's that. There's the medical bill side of it. Like, we've seen those stories where it helps. Okay, and then let's take it to the next phase. Walk-ons getting a scholarship. Talk about mm-hmm. that as a former walk-on. Like it's amazing to have your education paid for. Let's take it in the next phase. Players having a voice and being entrepreneurial. Love that element. Now, education around it, uh, financial wellness around it, all areas that I know schools are pouring into. When every time I meet with Elite 11 quarterbacks and we talk about getting paid and we talk about the bluntness of NIL, I say, look, right now you are a ranking as a quarterback. And the minute you sign an NIL deal, you become a dollar sign. So we're already competing with a helmet that you have to wear. We already have to try to take that off to tell your story. But now you're literally a transaction. So let's compete to humanize the game. And, and that's where I try to help these guys. Don't take the $500 deal to sell a sandwich down the street unless the person who owns the sandwich shop is going to help you build your business plan because you love restaurants and is going to help you fundraise to, you know, raise half a million dollars to open up your own, like do it with intention, intention. I always tell the athletes, like pay attention to your intention. If it's just to make money, then don't be mad when you're seen as just a transaction. If it's to really impact people's lives and tell a story around NIL, okay, let's get to work. So I'm a big fan. I have been for a long time. Uh, I've seen too many players struggle. I've seen too many, uh, you know, it's the it's the Chris Weber, right? Like how many times you sell on your jersey, you're not getting a dime off it. Like things that are just ridiculous. Yeah. In addition, 
it is ridiculous right now in terms of the lack of control, the lack of rules, the lack of oversight, the lack, the lack, the lack. Yeah. I mean, it's that is sad mm-hmm. because we're just going to keep seeing transfers. I don't know about you, but yeah. I knew more female basketball players' names in March Madness than I did men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I love hoop. I mean, I'm watching all the time. Uh, it just was a case of of I think being there. So I talked to a lot of athletes about. You know, the first question I often ask in team rooms is raise your hand if you're building a logo. Everybody raises their hand. And I say, stop, leverage the logo on your jersey. You know, like Tom Brady is still not bigger than Michigan. And he's the greatest mm-hmm. quarterback of all time. Like leverage yeah. the logo. Like how many people are you meeting that have gone to Utah, that have funded a building at Utah? Do you know who's funded these buildings? Like, have you spent time with them? Have you had a virtual cup of coffee? Like those are the things where I'm trying to empower athletes to say, yeah, get paid, go for it, but man, be intentional about it. And then the last part to bring up your boy, CJ Stroud, what he would say is don't lose sight of the big money. Yeah. And I think for everybody that's different. I don't know if Cam Rises is going to be a first round pick. Like he might be at peak earning years right now at mm-hmm. Utah. Yeah. I hope not. I hope not, but he might be right. Like money parks, is he going to be a first round draft pick at wide out? Probably not. Is he in peak earning years? Like maybe. So leverage that. So Maybe your big contract isn't your second one in the NFL or a rookie signing bonus, but maybe it's how you leverage the Utah fan base, Utah alums for that job after your third team releases you in year three. And you're like, what do I do now? Because everybody has to deal with what do I do now? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, what about when it comes to like the conference realignment? What, what, I mean, obviously it's been madness the last couple of years. And I, from all the reports everyone's been seeing, I don't think we're done. Um, what, what's kind of been your, I mean, obviously you've been right in the middle of it, right? So what's been your experience? What's been, and, and the future, what do you see happening? You know, James, this is my CJ Stroud moment, right? Like you just, <laughs> just ripped the bandaid off, just rip the bandaid go. again. <laughs> no, man, I mean, look, it's it's been a challenge. Um, I think we'd all be lying if we didn't say that, uh, to live it and to know what this league has stood for, to watch college football be flipped upside down was mm-hmm. was brutal in August. I think what made it even worse is that every campus I went to, every school president, every AD, everybody would say the same thing, which is, I wish it didn't happen, even though it did. Um, yes. And the timing was something that none of us could have predicted where like, it seemed like everything hit. And then the reality of like, you know, who's, who's truly pulling strings, you know, whether it's school presidents, it's a combination of school presidents, conference commissioners, media rights holders. Like, I mean, there's so much mm-hmm. yeah. uh, when it comes to that. And none of, I don't, I could, I'm over all that because none of it matters anymore. Like we, we landed where we landed. I think to your point, I, I don't think it's done. I'd be curious to see what it looks like. I'd be curious to see who's in charge. I think that there's a world in college athletics where you're, you know, we still have to look at the thing holistically. Like we talk about college football in the same financial structure often as gymnastics, softball, track and field, swimming, diving, like look at some of these schools with over 20 sports. Like it is at some point, the conversation I'd imagine will change to football. What is that? And then there's just going to be, again, unintended consequences of what does that mean for these other sports? Do they become club sports? Can we pay for travel for like, there's just realities around that. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I I go back to the same thing, how I started this conversation. My job is to seek and uncover the humanity of sports around the globe. And when I'm in America, it's college football. Uh, that's what I want to keep leaning into. I called the coach after the season and I said, God, it was such a great year. How come this sport feels so dark right now? Because that was when the portal was going and it was like portal Mm -hmm. coaches, uh, NIL deals, like under the table deals, lawsuits, whatever. And I think for me, my greatest joy is still sitting at the 50 and the build up to that as i'm looking at my screens in front of me is getting to know the stories and reliving and rehashing the micah Pittmans, cam rising brand keithy uh you know whomever it is to to, to elevate and celebrate on game day and, I, and i'm not going to lose that in the day i do i'll uh i'll move on because I, I i'm competing to be an optimist uh not a pessimist around this sport Yeah, I mean, there's just so much about the future that's unknown. And all of us who are massive college football fans, the changes are hard. I think 
a lot of them are positive, but it's just so jumbled up right now that we can't really see how it's all going to play out. And that is difficult for those of us who love it so much. Um, why do you love look, it? If you don't mind me asking. What, what, what do you do two love? love so much? Yeah. Why do you two love college football? Oh, that is a great question. It's kind of almost this intangible thing. Like being in the stadium on a Saturday when you beat USC on the last play, Cam rising, rushing into the, t into the end zone. Like it's all, you can't describe the excitement. I've almost passed out at numerous <laughs> Utah football games, which that doesn't happen like at any other experience in my life. I don't know, just being there at a game. It really is. It's kind of intangible. I don't know, James, how do you answer that? I don't know how you answer that. I, I love it. Uh, yeah, it, it's just for me, it's something I kind of grew up doing, right? Going to Utah football games with my dad and and watching Utah specifically change since the 90s where you could walk in and almost sit wherever you wanted to, right? Like, and then watching that transition happen when Urban Meyer came and now it's packed in there. They've had however many 80 something sellouts consecutively and just the, just the atmosphere the game day. It, it's it. Yeah. I'm with you, Brandon. It's hard to kind of put into words, but it's just, I don't know. It's just that thing you look forward to for me again, it, it's, it has some history to it. And now going back, going back to the games with my dad, sitting there with, you know, family and friends and you make buddies everywhere. It's just, you can kind of all share in the in the joy and the misery and and it's it's great. <laughs> yeah, there's cool. there's plenty of heartbreak in it as well. But... Plenty of heartbreak. Yeah, <laughs> my wife always asks me like, why why do you do this to yourself, right? When when they are they're right there against Washington this last year, right? They're right there and they lose and all, and it's just depression. Why why do you do this to yourself? It's because I love it. That's why. <laughs> I, I love it. That's why. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's cool. Cool. Thanks for answering. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, Yogi, this is probably a hard question to answer, but thinking back on the Pac-12, which is such a storied, historic conference, and we kind of don't know where it's going to go in the future, but looking back on it, are there a couple moments in Pac-12 history that really stand out to you? Maybe your favorites, maybe you were there for, maybe you were just watching them, like, can you think of a couple that really stand out to you? Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'll add, even when I mean, you coached at USC, yeah. right? That was Pac-10 era. I, I'd be curious if, you know, obviously a couple of things stood out from that, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, so much. Uh, as you referenced that question, I kind of had it in two different categories, like coaching. <clears throat> How can't you talk about, I mean, the day I remember the night Pete called me and it's midnight East Coast time. He's like, hey, what do you think about coming out? And I was in Pittsburgh getting my master's degree and something and calling games and doing radio. And I remember saying, yeah, I just don't want to coach because I had seen the coaching life. Oh. And he goes, cool, do recruiting. And I said, can I get my master's? He goes, yeah, we got you. Come on out to the beach, man. And I quit the, the next day. My boss was so mad at me. <laughs> Good guy. He was so mad at me. Uh, and I dipped out. And within two weeks, he sat me down on his couch over a burrito. I'll never forget it. He said, hey, do you want to coach? And I went and met with Sark, Steve Sarkeesian, and Lane Kiffin. And they were like, dude, there's no better place other than the Patriots in the world right now. Like, you're going to kill it no matter if you do TV or coaching. And I was like, of course. And I basically slept in the office for four years. And I feel like I got my PhD in football, in organizational leadership, a legitimate master's degree from SC. Like, that phone call. I know how fortunate I am in my 20s to have a man who took the clay that my parents curated and shaped, but he molded it. Like he molded me into the father I am and the husband I am and the analyst I am. Like so much of that time was he and I sleeping in the office because he didn't want to drive because he, he lived 30, 40 minutes away and it'd be midnight. And I was just like, screw it. I might as well sleep on this couch in Sark's office. And <laughs> we would just talk about life. And from that job, I wrote his book. I got an analyst. Like I, I know that that SC jumping off point, it launched Lane and Sark into head coaching. It launched me into the media. So I, I go with, I just think like we in life, you, you have two things that I think are most powerful. One is agency and one is gratitude and the agency to make the choice. And then can you live with gratitude around it? And I think of that moment with, with those two things jumping out to me, the agency to say, yeah, I'm going to leave Pennsylvania 
like middle of nowhere punk kid to the beach and never leave. So I, I think, of, I mean, there's so many like I could think of, but highlights then, of course, we lose to Texas. That game was powerful. Rushing down to the locker room to hear what is he going to say? What did he tell the team? And he said, look, 19 seconds are never going to define us. You know, and wow. and it was awesome. Like, it was just a moment. Uh, the night before the game, he was telling me, hey, we, if we win a third one, like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Like, it, there were so many, so many wow. moments there. And then as an analyst, um, Marcus's Heisman speech that night in New York, I thought changed youth football for about a decade because it was such about his Ohana and his family. I mm-hmm. uh, love that, that man. Uh, Caleb's Heisman speech when he said, quote, I was taught at a young age to look in the mirror and love the man looking back. When I talk to young quarterbacks around like the mental health of the game, like I show that clip every time. Those two are, are big. I think calling games, like I can't help but uh, I go back to like the Darren Carrington, Oregon, Utah game. Well, hi, though. I called like, that game. Well, I called that game and remember it. Oh. it was like, and then, and then the, the next year when like they didn't spike it, or two years later, whatever it was, like, there, there were some, some moments there in those games. Uh, I mean, we've called some great games. I called SC at Oregon State last year, walk off. Caleb um, Williams, like, like this past season, I felt like we every week was like a nail biter. Yeah. But I probably net out to answer and put a bow on the question is, uh, I'm going to walk away from this league with true relationships that shape my life. I came in, punk 22-year-old kid, left coaching with a master's degree, and truly shaped by Coach Carroll to broadcasting and learning on the fly with partners like Steve Fiziok, Hall of Fame broadcaster, Kevin Calabro, he'll be a Hall of Famer, and Ted Robinson is already a Hall of Famer. Like those are my three guys. Wow. Like, and I went from single to relationship to married to kids uh, to now in my 40s. Like this has been a 20 year journey. And I just think of those people, Ashley Adamson, Mike Yam, like, mm-hmm. All these people I invited my wedding, you know, like I, I go to that, you know, honestly, like you don't remember a lot of the games. I remember certain games. I remember calling a Arizona SC game when I was literally on the sideline and the guy at ESPN called me and said, Hey, can you call the game? Our announcer just lost his voice. Oh and, he, and I was like, sure. And he goes, have you been drinking? And I said, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> and next, you know, 10 minutes later, I'm calling the game on live national radio for ESPN and like a hoodie. Wow. So like there, there's so many of those, but it's going to net out with the people. That's awesome. I, uh, this kind of just builds off of that, but what's your I, college football, right? You made us answer it, but what's your, what is your favorite thing? And I think I kind of have an idea after talking to you for the last 30 minutes. What is your favorite thing about college football? Really simple. Like you could see it behind me. Uh, behind me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is the ball. Yeah. Like I, I really believe this to- in totality that none of us are bigger than the ball. Without the game, you don't have a job. Without the game, I don't have a job. Without the game, the players don't have a sport. Without the game, the coaches don't have a job. Like so, anytime anybody thinks they're bigger than the game, you know me well enough. I'm, I don't ever like come from the top rope, but if I see that arrogance, I will. Like yeah. I, I'm, I have a ball on my desk at all times to remind myself it is about the game. And I think we are all as a collective media in an era of it's about me and my catchphrase and my logo and my T-shirt. And I'm like, dude, it's about the game. I'm gifted this headset to stand at the 50 and celebrate the game. And without the ball, there's no game. So I go to that. And then there's so much that's, that, that's, that spawns from that, right? Kai Whittingham said it, I think, in his first meeting in spring ball. Like, you, these will be the best relationships in your life. And he's right. Like, you will meet so many people. Like, football has taken me literally across the world. I, I own a football franchise in Paris, a small part of one, because of this game. And if I didn't be able to pack full broadcaster, I don't need Jason Johnson who played at Arizona, who's also a filmmaker. And all of a sudden my kids and I aren't going to Paris this summer to run with the team out of the tunnel. You know, like no. it's the game, it's the ball, man. And I mean, I, I, I don't meet Mark Harlan. I don't know Kyle Whittingham. I don't get the interview, like all of the things it's, I, I hope when I'm done, people would say, man, Yogi, like I always say, how great is ball? Like they literally would say, his his love and respect for the game was always paramount and how he celebrated and coached the fan was um, something we enjoyed. I, I hope that they'd say a version of that. And if not, then I probably didn't, didn't do a good job. Well, I think 
for those of us who have watched you over the years, that definitely comes through. So yeah. you have done your job. You've accomplished that. We have so much respect for you and what you've done on the Pac-12 Network over the last few years. And I mean, the number one question that we have received once we announced that you were coming on the podcast was what's next for you? And I don't know if you can answer that, but we're hoping that you have something or that we're still going to be able to see you broadcasting. I don't know how much you can say or want to say, but what is next for Yogi? Yeah, uh, I, I, um, I know this. I'm going to continue to cover this team like in totality. Uh, if that means it's going to be on Saturdays or Wednesdays, I'll know and I'll be able to share in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I'm not going to stop talking Utah football, coming on shows like this, connecting to the fan base, connecting to the community, getting to the players. Um, that's not going to end. I, I think that the West Coast is uh, in continuous need for a voice in college football. Um, and voice is. You are part of that. I hope to be part of that. And I'm going to continue being a part of that, regardless of what I'm doing on Saturdays. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ping you back in a couple weeks. Um, I got to finish my contract. I'm going to do it with great integrity of doing these last three or four spring games um, here on the Pac-12. And we're going to kill it. We got Utah, SC, Oregon, maybe UW after that. And then I'll be able to kind of share where I'm going next. But it has been a, you know, it, it's it's been brutal on one hand, but it's been beautiful on the other. You know, Ashley Adamson, Adamson gave me this quote, um, you know, a couple of days after it all fell apart, which was, this universe that we all live in wasn't going to impact the conference that's over 100 years old just to do it. Like it has bigger plans. And it was like, you have to trust that. And it's been really fun in the off season. I would have signed a 20 year contract and been good. I love this league. I would have been here forever. And, and I hope to do that. My goal still remains the same, which is to call the Rose Bowl. Um, I just don't know who's going to be playing in it, <laughs> you know, or, or what that even looks like moving yeah. forward. Yeah. But you got to roll with it. And it's been fun to meet with a bunch of people within the industry and have to flex that muscle a little bit. And and I'm excited about what's next. But I'll be talking about the logo behind you guys and the one that's on your shirt for sure. Awesome. Well, hey, yeah. we, we can't thank you enough for coming on, uh, really. For, for the time, it, it's great. I know that we're you know excited to have you out here this weekend. If you find time, bring the clubs. We'll go play 18. I don't know. Nice. Um, uh, it should be nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really appreciate you coming on. It was it was a, it was an honor to have you. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for the invite. Love what you guys do, and I hope to run into you on Saturday at Rice Eccles. We'll be there. So cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. No, thanks, Yogi. It was it was okay. it was an honor talking to you. Thank you very much. All right. So, I'll see you soon. Okay. I'm go pick up these kids from school. All right. Yeah. We'll see you Bye. 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 Oh man. That was amazing. That was so good, Brian. That was so good. So, so good. again, Utah fans. Brian. I just love. He's I, awesome. Don't you just love he, Yogi Roth? Don't you just love. I, I mean, after listening to that, I just, I have so much even more respect for the guy and I, he didn't break his next steps here on the podcast. He hinted but to it, though. I don't know if you caught that. He some, mentioned ca calling Big Ten games. I don't know what that means. Yeah, um, so. Don't read it too 12. much into it. No, Anyways. Anyway. Anyway. Anyways, Utah fans, Thank I you hope so you much. enjoyed that as much as we did. He is. He really is one of the best in the business. So I'm so grateful he came on with us again. Spring game, Utah spring game this Saturday. It's on the Pac-12 network, so he will be calling that game our last one on the Pac-12 Network, which is just craziness. But thanks for listening, watching. Make sure you are subscribed, follow along, share this with your friends. And spring football is here. And then, man, we're going to start getting into the season. And so make sure you hit that notification button because we're not going anywhere. Yeah, we got Go some youths. other things lined up, too. We're having some other guests on, hopefully, in the next month month and a half, something like that. Some, uh, some other people we're, we're, that we're very excited about as well. Yeah. So, so stay tuned. Along. Stay yeah. tuned. Go youth. Go youth.